Hey there everyone, welcome back to another video with me, Ben Rogajan, aka The Seattle Data Guy. Today we're going to talk about data engineering and AWS, or how you can actually use uh, AWS as a data engineer. In this video, we're going to mostly be focusing on Lambdas, as well as a few other components, and how you can use it in your everyday workflows. For this video, we're going to specifically uh, dive into a few different things. One, we're going to talk about what an AWS Lambda function is. We're also going to talk about some of the pros and cons in terms of picking it as well as possibly some other options you might decide to use. And then we're going to go through a real life coding example. So we're going to go on AWS, we're going to build a function, we're going to automate it uh, in a few different ways, and we're going to kind of see the results. So with that, let's just dive into using AWS as a data engineer. So first of all, what is uh, a Lambda, right? Like what is an AWS Lambda function? You probably hear about it. You may have heard the term serverless and that's kind of what it's attached to, right? Like it is a serverless computing service, which essentially means that you can have this code, this script that you want to run and not have to set up a server to run it. Now, I know that doesn't make sense. There is a server somewhere, right? Like somewhere virtually there is a server that exists that will eventually run your function. So let's say you're trying to automate uh, some API call to actually pull data, right? Like you might, might want to at midnight extract data from a source. So you set up a Lambda to run which we'll show you how to do that later. Well, instead of having to maybe set up an EC2 instance with some, you know, something set up with cron uh, that you're gonna have to pay for all the time, right? You're gonna have to pay for all the time that it's running. You can set up this serverless function that gets triggered usually by some sort of external event, whether that's something calling it a time slot, you know, time period uh, passing to one o'clock, you gotta run it. An event external uh, happening, some data being shifted into S3, whatever the actual event is, you can almost see this the same way people used to set up these basic scripts in the past and have cron call it, right? It might not be this fancy uh, complex uh, function or, or module or whole code base. It might just be this one little script that you need to run at a certain time. And that's really all it is, right? If there's no real server you have to allocate. You just have this script that at certain times is spun up. So with that, you get a few benefits. Like I referenced, it's cost effective. So that's one benefit, right? You don't have to run it all the time. If you're only running this script, you know, once every two months, uh, right? Like that's gonna be very cheap. Versus if you were to use something like MWAA, so you were, which also could be running these tasks at certain times using a scheduler, which is uh, Amazon's Apache Airflow instance or managed instance, it is far cheaper. The MWAA uh, costs easily three to $500 a month. Whereas this Lambda is gonna cost you, you know, a dollar, a few pennies, whatever it's gonna end up costing you. I've seen people pay pretty low costs in, on their AWS Lambdas. Uh, it's easy to scale, right? Like every Lambda that you end up calling, it doesn't, you don't need to figure out where it's gonna run it'll run itself, right? Um, you don't need to spend time uh, setting up distributed systems. You've got this basic Lambda, it'll end up running on its own. Obviously, wherever it's going, right? if it's going into some database, you might have to figure out that side. But in terms of the actual Lambdas and running the, the scripts, that's not a problem. Also, if you're in AWS, Lambdas are heavily integrated into everything else, right? You can literally set it up so that if something happens in, in S3 or DynamoDB or somewhere, a Lambda is fired, right? Whether that's because you set up a step function, which we'll talk a little bit about, or just because you've set it up that it triggers based on something else happening using uh, event bridge, which we'll dig into. It's very easy to do, right? It's it's not complex. You don't have to set up code to do it. You just you know drop down and you select the, the event. And another benefit I didn't reference about serverless is you don't have to spend time updating your server or, or, or managing the server, right? Instead, you just have this serverless instance that you don't have to think too much about. Now, with anything, there are pros and cons with any architecture decision. If you decide to use a Lambda, there's a trade-off. Uh, one, you could argue there's a cold start problem, right? Uh, if you've got a server running all the time, it's far easier for that code to run because it doesn't have to, you know, turn on or, or set up some instance somewhere. Another issue is you often could run into some runtime uh, limitations, like there's only so much storage, it can only run so long, it might only have so much compute, and so there might be some limitations there. Obviously, there's also vendor lock-in, right? Like if you set up all your infrastructure, like I talked about earlier, with event bridge and you have, you know, DynamoDB connected to Lambda, S3, etc., it's gonna be much harder to move because you're gonna to have to now set up similar things in a different vendor. So there's some lock-in if you use AWS Lambda, but that goes with any solution you pick. Another thing that I didn't reference is obviously it's just effective on one side if you are using this script very you know minimally, but on the flip side, if you're hitting this Lambda all the time, eventually it will likely become cost prohibitive, right? Um, depending on how you set it up, you're likely paying a margin um, on top of Lambdas right? Versus owning your own server. So there is this trade-off where it's like, well, if you use it enough, eventually you will 
spend more on it than it's actually probably worth to just spin up your own server. And some people don't like having their hands tied, right? Like logging is a little more limited. Uh, whereas if you own your own server, you've got a little more control. So logging and monitoring can feel a little less, uh, is a little more limited because you can only use kind of what AWS provides you. But it's not bad, and especially for scripts, I think it's usually good enough. And so those are some of the pros and cons of using an AWS Lambda. Now, again, there are other solutions you might use. I referenced MWAA earlier, or Apache Airflow's managed instance on AWS, which could be for more complex tasks, right? In this case, we're going to do a very simple task, right? We, uh, we're going to automate some basic events that basically cause a Lambda to fire off. But if you have more complex DAGs, you might want to do something like use MWAA, I'll put in another shout out for Mage, which I am a, an advisor for them. So there are plenty of options of how you can automate your tasks, especially if you're talking about ingesting data or maybe doing a basic transform. You can also use things like Snowpipe, which also has a trigger for basically when something loads into S3, it automatically ingests uh, into Snowflake. There are tons of honestly um, other alternatives. And if I think of a few more, I'll add them here. But with that guys, that, that's my intro. So let's actually do the thing you came here for, which is code. So let's dive into coding. Uh, and using AWS Lambdas and automating some basic events. In this case, we're gonna scrape my YouTube analytics and show it to you guys. Let's dive into that section next. All right, let's dive into uh, AWS Lambda and actually looking how you can set up a function that can uh, pull essentially data from an API uh, and put it into an S3 bucket. So first let's go over creating a new Lambda and then we'll go over this run data test example. Um, we'll go over the code and, and kind of what it does. So if I hit create function, this is where you're going to essentially create your AWS Lambda. Again, you can either create it from scratch, which is generally what I do, but there are also blueprints um, to give you kind of the baseline of maybe you've got a microservice you need to build. Um, you can even do things like get something from S3 or, or, or similar uh, functions that, you know, you do all the time. So they, those do exist. You can find the one in the right uh, language. That way you don't have to build it from scratch. But for today, we're going to do author from scratch. So what you'll see here, obviously, is you can first or you first need to pick kind of what you're going to run it in, right? Is it going to be Node? Is it going to be Python? And in this case, we'll do Python, but there's tons of options here in terms of what you can build your serverless function uh, in. So we'll do Python. Um, less concerned in this case about architecture, but if, if that's something that you're interested in, you, know, you can definitely pick something there. Uh, and from there, there are a few advanced settings you may or may not need to know. Um, in particular, there is enable VPC. So if you, for example, have a uh, external source you might be trying to hit, like I had an API I was trying to hit that needed to whitelist my IP address, uh, you might have to create essentially a static IP address, which is arguably a video in itself, but I'll at least put a link below if you need to create your own static IP address um, on a VPC. So you create a VPC that has a static IP address. That way, as you're kind of going through, you, you know where it's coming from. Um, that way you can give whoever needs to whitelist you um, the right IP address. So you'll see here, I have a Lambda VPS, or sorry, VPC, um, which is acting as that static IP address. Um, there's a few other things I haven't had to use. Uh, you know, you might have a function URL, which will be, uh, if you wanna actually set it so that an external set of code might be able to call it, almost similar to an API, but there actually is a way you set up an API gateway. So that's a different project uh, altogether in a way, where if you need to set up an API, uh, you can create a function and then put an API gateway in front of it that then knows what the where the function is. Um, but that is one way you can just ping essentially your serverless function to to run it in some cases. So obviously you need to give it a name. So we're we're going to be pulling from an API. It's a weather API. So it's just weather run weather API or run weather extract something like that. It's a pretty straightforward script. So you can then hit create function. Actually, I'm going to remove this create function just so we can kind of look at it. Now, what you'll see, obviously here, you can actually put your code, whatever you want to write. You will run into a few specific problems likely. So for example, uh, if you want to get something like pandas uh, added into uh, your Python script, essentially you want to import pandas, uh, you're going to have to add a layer. So layers essentially allow you to add external libraries. You can hit add layer, for example, and there are a few that exist out of the box. You can see like pandas exists out of the box. Um, so there are a few that do, but you'll likely have to uh, create your own uh, layer here and there for some of the uh, functions that you're building, uh, which I'll link how to do that. I generally go through Cloud Shell, which is right here, um, just because it always seems to be the most consistent where I always end up building a layer correctly. 
but I'll, I'll put a link on how you can do that below. So you'll end up creating your function, which we'll go over in the actual code uh, here in a second. Um, but the other things you'll likely end up needing to change is probably something in configuration. Generally, I do have to mess around with the general configuration. So you'll see here, you might have to increase memory. There was a, a database I was recently pulling from where I think it was taking somewhere in the range of like two or three minutes to pull from uh, that database. And I you know, ended up increasing both the memory and ephemeral, ephemeral storage. And that pretty quickly changed that to, I think, like a 30 second pull. Uh, you do end up paying for, you know, uh, in increased size. You know, the, the amount you pay is, is somewhat connected to how long it runs, plus uh, the size uh, and, and instance you're, you're setting up. You can see hit view pricing here. So different different sizes do cost uh, more uh, if you increase it. So do, do keep in mind that you do pay for that. Uh, and then usually you have to increase timeout. So if your if your function keeps timing out, you know you run it in, in three seconds, it dies. Uh, likely you should uh, increase how long it, it has till times out. It maxes out at 15 minutes. So that's when you know if you you're running longer than that, you know it's going to kick it out regardless. But that's just the basic configuration. So you can change memory, ephemeral storage, and how long it takes till times out. Now, if we go through this, I already have run data test. So this is a pretty straightforward function. Okay, so if we look at this example here, you'll scroll down. The, the main function that essentially will need to exist is this Lambda handler. Uh, you'll see it has event and context. So essentially event is where you pass data to um, your, your function and context is more about the actual context of like what's running it, where like giving high level information about, as, as it kind of suggests the context of what is running in. So events really gonna be, if you pass data, uh, of some kind, uh, it'll get passed to event. And then if you want to pull it out, for example, you, if you pass it the API key, or maybe you passed it um, some sort of filter or information that you know you want to give to the API itself, um, it would be an event. Um, from there, you know we're we're giving an API key, which in this case we're we're going to open weather API um, to pull like the weather from in this case a Latin longitude. Uh, we're only going to be pulling one row of data, but we're keeping it simple. Uh, you can have uh, environmental variables, which is one way to store, obviously, uh, secret information. That's not the best way. The best way would be to use AWS Key Service. But we're just doing this for an example, so keeping this simple. Um, the Key Service adds a little bit more code, so I didn't want to do that. After that, you'll see I uh, have a function here that actually gets the weather data using the API key. So I'll pass that information. Then using that data that we get back. Uh, we end up writing it to a CSV. Again, we're just writing one row, so we're keeping this pretty straightforward. Uh, from there, after we we pass in and, and write that CSV, essentially, we end up uh, creating a file name. So we have this SDG CSV. Uh, I add a timestamp to that file name just so it, we know when it came in. So then we put that into an S3 bucket and folder uh, that I have out there. So this is just a basic example of essentially inserting that data into an S3 bucket or putting it, I guess is a better term. You might then afterwards load that into or insert that into like a Snowflake instance or Databricks. You might have like a snow pipe that automatically triggers as soon as it gets that information. Um, so that's that's pretty much the straightforward script we're using. Uh, if we scroll above, we can actually see the get weather uh, data. So this is again, a pretty straightforward function. It only is pulling one row of data. So you're not gonna see a loop here. Um, I'm just parsing this one data set here and returning it. So we're going, we're, going and doing your classic request.get to get that API information. If it's, you know, if, if, if it comes back good, we say, okay, great. Now return that data, right? Parse it out, return it. And then we end up again, writing it to a CSV and keeping it pretty simple from there. Like I said, we're also adding in a file name here. So we're changing and writing a timestamp to the file name. Uh, essentially, we're just getting that, that date time now uh, and then parse splitting up the original file name. So in this case, it was SDG. And then we're adding in an extension here. So we're actually adding in the timestamp for so year, year, you know, month, month, day, day, hour, hour, minute, minute, kind of set up dot CSV. So we're keeping it pretty straightforward there. That way we don't have to think about all the configuration of that file name. We're just letting the function do it for us. So yeah, it gets the file name, it gets the data. And then from there again, we're just taking that data uh, and running it and loading it into essentially S3. So if you want to test this function, right, you can literally just hit uh, the, the test function. So I can hit test. 
And you'll notice it's essentially run successfully. And I've already checked that these are loading into S3. So it's loading into my S3 bucket. And from here, you might have a trigger again in event bridge, which we'll go over here in a second. But there's a few different ways you can actually set up things uh, so that they run uh, maybe afterwards or maybe something that actually triggers this Lambda in the first place. So next, we're going to kind of go over how you can trigger this, this Lambda. So for that, we're going to go to event bridge, Amazon event bridge. So you've got this Lambda that you've built. You can go to event bridge and there's a few things you can have a schedule. So this is very similar to cron, so I create a schedule. You know, test schedule. We can literally go down and say recurring schedule and use cron based scheduling. So, uh, and it'll, it'll give an example of how it's going to run. So if I say like day of the month, and then you can use some this, it'll actually tell you when it's going to run here. So if we, we go below, it'll say, okay, it's going to run on March 1st, uh, at one. And then basically it's going to go every, every, and then it's going to go every minute because I've set it up to every minute. So if I want to change it to only one at the one minute and only the first day of the month, you can kind of see that it's set up to run. This is going to run on March, on March 1st, April 1st at 1.01. Um, if you want to change that. Yeah. Okay. So if you want this just to run essentially every day versus a specific day of the month, um, that's how you'd set up your cron schedule. They also have rate based scheduling, which basically means like if you just want it be very simple and say like every 12 hours and not think about it too much but those are the, those are the ways you can essentially set up a schedule and then they also let you say like during certain windows of time oh let's just say this is off uh and then from there you choose what you want to actually do again you, you don't just have to do lambdas you can have a start a pipeline here uh, for SageMaker or a ton of other things but we'll just do lambda it'll say which one and you'll you know we'll do run data test and then you could actually give it a certain payload going back to that event you can actually give it information for that event to, to parse from. So you can give it JSON there. You said next. And then from here, there's a ton of extra configuration. So do you want to retry things after a certain period of time in case something fails? Um, do you want to send like certain messages, etc.? Keep going next. And essentially from there, it's going to check. Hey, are you good with this? Okay, create the schedule. So that's event bridge. It's, it's pretty nifty. Again, if you have cron jobs anyways that you're running, and you just need to migrate them over. They're very simple. It's really easy to set up. There are a few other options you can definitely use with Amazon Event Bridge. Uh, for now, we'll just go over Event Bridge and Schedules because I think that's the one most people commonly use. Uh, hopefully, this was a great intro in Lambdas and how you can actually set them up. Again, next, I would like to do a video on S3 uh, and how you can take that and load data automatically into something like Snowflake. There's a few different ways, including things like using snow pipes, and then maybe we'll, we'll dig into Athena there and running queries on top of uh, S3. Anyways, thanks so much for watching this video and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks all. Goodbye.